ever looked out at the stars and wondered if there's anyone else out there? A different type of creature living on another planet just waiting to be introduced to a different species. How come we've never stumbled upon other life than we are in our galaxy? And more interestingly, if we aren't alone in the universe, it's curious that no one has ever tried to get into contact with us. The Fermi Paradox aims to answer many of these questions. Hey, let's be honest, they've puzzled scientists, philosophers, and the general population for decades. It's named after the Italian physicist Enrico Fermi, who first proposed it in 1950. Given that the universe is vast and there's a pretty good chance other planets exist that could potentially harbor life, it seems quite normal to assume that there must be other intelligent civilizations out there somewhere. However, despite humanity's best efforts, we have not yet detected any real evidence of life outside of our planet. Apart from people we've sent into outer space on purpose, of course. This lack of evidence has made people wonder if we really are truly alone in the universe. More so, if there's another, more sinister reason for why we have not yet found any aliens. Now, one possible theory suggested is that we simply have not looked long or hard enough. The universe is immense, and other civilizations could likely exist on planets that are too far away for us to detect. The technology we would need to identify these civilizations is probably not even invented yet. Or even if it is, it's surely not powerful enough to reach across light years of space. Could it be that we are the only intelligent life in the universe? This theory suggests that the conditions necessary for life to evolve and thrive are very rare. Like in our case, for example, the fact that our Earth has water, a stable atmosphere, a magnetic field, and a pretty reasonable climate. <clears throat> Some scientists can't help but think that ours is the only planet in the universe that has managed to produce these conditions, and because of that, also have intelligent beings wandering around its surface. However, this theory does not fully explain the paradox, as it does not account for the fact that the universe is so vast and has been around for so long, way longer than we have. The age of the universe is estimated to be around 13.8 billion years old, while our planet is only about 4.5 billion years old, give or take a few million. The more plausible suggestion is that there are other intelligent civilizations out there, but they are simply too far away for us to detect. This theory suggests that these civilizations may be located on planets that are much farther away from us than we can currently detect or that they may be located in different galaxies entirely. Well, sorry to break it to you, but the universe is also expanding, which means that things aren't staying put. Even if we had the technical capabilities to start traveling between planets and galaxies, they might simply be moving away from us at a speed we'd never manage to catch up to. Just like all the previous ones, this theory has some flaws. That's because it does not fully explain why we have not yet detected any evidence of these civilizations. If they're far away, we're surely not able to detect them. But why aren't they trying to get in touch with us? It's hard to imagine that all of the other civilizations that may be chilling in our universe as we speak are less evolved than us. Looking back on a planetary scale, humans are really young. If we imagine that our planet is just one year old, then humans popped up on its surface during the final 20 minutes on December 31st. Compared to the whole existence of the entire universe, we're simply a blip. The final theory is that there are other intelligent civilizations out there, but they're simply too technologically advanced for us to detect. This idea indicates that these creatures are light years ahead of us in terms of science and development. They may already have technologies that are far beyond what we're capable of and they are supposedly using these technologies to stay hidden from us. Sadly, this theory is somewhat more plausible, though it does mean that no other civilization wants to be friends with us and come out and play in outer space. Well, it does explain why we have not yet detected any real evidence of life outside our planet. But it does suggest another, more sinister fact. It raises the question of why these civilizations would choose to stay hidden, and what their motivations might be. Sadly, the Fermi Paradox remains an open question, 
and scientists and philosophers continue to debate the possible explanations for why we have not yet found any friends to play with in the universe. Only time will tell whether or not we'll be able to solve this mystery. There's still a lot we have to accomplish when it comes to space exploration. In the future, space travel will continue to be mostly carried out by scientific and commercial robotic missions. However, the idea of your everyday human traveling to space will likely remain a dream for a long time. That's because of the high costs and dangers of injury associated with the process. Launching a single person into space currently requires a significant amount of energy, and the journey exposes individuals to extreme radiation and high speeds within a field of debris. Certainly, there have been attempts by rich people to make space travel more accessible, but it's still out of reach for most people. A single seat for a ride on a Soyuz capsule costs over $20 million. Some scientists believe we should invest more time and effort into space travel. But if you think about it, there's really no other place like Earth for us nearby. We can't breathe outside of our atmosphere, and there's no space object in our solar system that can support life as we know it. Take Mars, for instance. Even if we manage to travel there eventually, by the time we reach the red planet, we would have already spent months living in microgravity. That also means it would take us a lot of time to physically recover before they could start exploring this planet. After years of research, NASA figured out that living in microgravity conditions heavily affects the human body. It means loss of bone and muscle mass, as well as a shift in the normal movement of body fluids, which tend to go upwards. This can lead to pressure on the eyes and even affect our vision. Now, just because we can't confirm there's life outside of our planet doesn't mean we didn't have some pieces of evidence throughout the years. Like in 2001, for example, when NASA researchers suggested an interesting theory about Jupiter's moon Europa. They mentioned that frozen bits of bacteria may be the cause of Europa's red tinge and its mysterious infrared signal. While magnesium salts were previously thought to be responsible for the infrared reflections, data from bacteria living right here on our planet that thrive in extreme conditions fits the data just as well. These bacteria also have red and brown coloring, which could explain the reddish appearance of Europa. While it is unlikely that bacteria could survive on Europa's surface due to the extremely cold temperatures and lack of atmosphere, it is possible that they could survive in the warmer liquid interior and be released through geological activity. Going back to 1977, when a strange signal from outer space was picked up by a radio telescope at Ohio State University. The signal lasted for 37 seconds and was so strange that the person who saw it wrote WOW on the printout. The signal was very different from the usual signals that come from space. Sure, it could have come from a huge event in space, but it could also have come from intelligent creatures living in the universe that had a very strong transmitter. To this day, no one knows for sure what caused it. Hey Mythbusters, today we're debunking some classic space myths. Hop on the next space shuttle and let's get to the bottom of these tales once and for all. Picture this, you're floating weightlessly in space, sipping on a cup of delicious hot chocolate, when a peculiar thought pops into your head. Can you scream in outer space? And if yes, would anyone hear that scream? answer to this one. You can't hear sounds in outer space. It's not that sounds don't exist. It's just that you can't hear them. There's no one better to clarify this myth than Chris Hadfield. He's been on a couple of spacewalks during his life as an astronaut. And once you're out there in the darkness of space, you can't hear anything. All you hear is silence. Complete silence. But hey, just around the corner is a massive ball of explosion, aka the sun. We just can't hear the explosions happening because there's no medium for sound to travel through. It would be quite uncomfortable for an astronaut though if they could hear all the noises going on in outer space. Now, imagine you're zipping through space, feeling like a futuristic superhero, when a shooting star passes by your side. But wait, is it really a star? Unfortunately, shooting stars are not stars at all. 
They are small space rocks known as meteoroids, entering Earth's atmosphere and creating a stunning light show. Oh, and since we're debunking myths, let's head straight for another one. You've probably heard that meteors only crash into Earth on extremely rare occasions, like once every dinosaur extinguishing apocalypse. That's not true. Scientists estimate that about 48 tons of meteoritic material fall on Earth each day. But almost all of this material is vaporized in Earth's atmosphere. The bright trail we see in the night sky is what we popularly call a shooting star. Next time you make a wish upon a shooting star, remember, you're actually hoping on a tiny piece of space debris. It's not so romantic after all. Can we or can we not fly into the stratosphere on air balloons? Apparently, we can. The Earth's stratosphere starts relatively close to the ground, about 7 or 8 miles up from the Earth's surface, but it continues a long way up. If you were to fly yourself all the way into the stratosphere with some type of air balloon, just make sure you have really good equipment at hand. You'll need a special suit and some breathing devices because air starts to get pretty thin the higher you get. Of course, if you do go all the way up, you need to get a picture of the Earth's curvature. So take a chest harness with you where you can put a special camera or something like that. And how about you live stream the whole thing? That would be a first! Imagine it's been 102 days since you left Earth. You've adapted well to life in outer space, but something weird is happening to your body. You're getting taller. How is that even possible? Don't stress about it, it's completely normal. The truth of the matter is, you're not getting taller. This is what happens to your body when it's not under the effect of gravity. Our body has natural space between vertebrae and joints. On Earth, this space is almost completely squeezed due to the force of gravity. But in space, your body gets some time off of the pushing force of gravity and begins to stretch more and more. So yes, astronauts can grow up to 3% taller when they're on long missions. And here's a curiosity, NASA has that all covered when they're tailor-making spacesuits, of course. This way, astronauts will always have extra space in their suits. Once astronauts are back on Earth, the anti-gravity effect will wear off. So maybe they'll spend a few days wearing capri pants before it fits perfectly on their bodies again. Never have I ever pictured an airplane door bursting open mid-flight and a bunch of passengers being sucked into the atmosphere like flying feathers. Well, I'm betting most of you have had similar thoughts when getting inside a plane. Now imagine if this were to happen in outer space. Common knowledge says that if an astronaut is sucked out of an airlock, this person would be burnt to a crisp. Brace yourselves, because this is not only true, but the reality of it is way worse. According to astronaut Chris Hadfield, this is what would happen. The part of your body in the shade of the sun would experience temperatures of negative 418 degrees Fahrenheit, while the part of you getting sunlight would burn at around 480 degrees Fahrenheit. Your lungs would collapse, and your blood would start to boil like tea water. So, you would burn, freeze, lose your ability to breathe, and boil. Yikes! How many times have you heard that astronauts have to work out every second of every day, otherwise they'll pass out? This is a complete myth. Remember we talked about gravity earlier? Due to the lack of gravity in outer space, our bodies don't have to do any heavy work. Our torsos don't have to sustain the weight of our heads. And we don't have to make any effort to move our legs because, essentially, there's no walking in outer space. Now, imagine living like that for six months, or even a year of your life. Your muscles could turn into jello. That's why astronauts work out. They'll strap themselves and run on a treadmill, or they'll do some weightlifting in a special machine. This way, their muscles won't feel the lack of gravity too much. They do need to keep hydrated, though. You know what? If I was an astronaut, I'd ask NASA if I could take my super soft water flask up into space with me. You've probably heard that space smells like burnt steak or barbecue sauce. Now, as much as this sounds absurd, this myth is more true than it is false. Astronauts obviously can't smell space when they're in it because they can't take off their helmets. 
They usually smell it once a space vehicle docks and they open up a hatch. Apparently, what causes this smell is the presence of hydrocarbons that float around in space. Who would have thought, huh? Hey, smart people, let me ask you a question. Do you really think that if astronauts fly at the speed of light, they won't age a single second? I knew you'd say no. Let's get a few things straight. First of all, we haven't figured out how to operate vehicles at the speed of light. This would require an immense amount of energy, and we don't have the technology to do that. Second, even if we managed to send a human inside a spacecraft that traveled at the speed of light, this person would still age. They would age differently than the people who remained on Earth, that's a fact, but they would still age. Do you lot really think there's such a thing as immortality? Nah. If you've seen the first Avatar, then you certainly remember that humans only managed to get to Pandora because they traveled in cryosleep. In other words, they froze their bodies, put them in a cryo bed, and traveled for years without aging. Yes, this sounds amazing, but we still don't have the technology to do that. Our bodies are mainly made out of water, right? And when you freeze water, it expands. That's why you should never leave soda cans unattended in your freezer. Right now, if we froze a person's body, the water inside of it would expand, harming tissues and organs. So no, we can't cryosleep our way into interstellar travel. Not yet, at least. Here's a crazy thought. What would happen if an astronaut took a drone with him on one of their spacewalks? Unless it's a NASA-designed drone, maybe the thing would freeze and burn like humans would if they went into space without a suit. But hey, a person can dream, can't they? Let's see now. Mobile phones, remote surgery, communication satellites. You think it's just another science show on TV. But wait, the image on the screen is black and white. A middle-aged man wearing glasses is talking. It's a BBC documentary from 1964. The man's name is Arthur C. Clarke. Yep, that's the guy who helped Kubrick make the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. You up the volume and can't believe your own ears. Clark is describing our present as if he were right next to you. So, what exactly is he saying? The world in which we can instantly contact each other. This is a no-brainer. Clark was talking about messaging apps. He spoke about how we would be able to contact our friends anywhere on Earth. And the best part is, we wouldn't have to know where they were. Yup, that sounds a lot like using a smartphone. <laughs> Mr. Clark, you won't even have to know your friend's number. The device will remember it for you. The phones in the 1960s weren't that advanced. This was the time when manufacturers were just starting to move from rotary dial phones to push-button ones. But Clark saw further in the future of communication. He told a tale of how a person would be able to conduct business from Haiti or Bali as if they were in London. It was a BBC show, so don't be surprised he mentions the English capital. Anyone who's ever Zoomed or Skyped knows what the man was talking about. Digital nomads were hard to imagine 60 years ago. There was no other way to earn money but to have a 9-to-5 job. Today, you can open your laptop and work from anywhere on the planet. Next up, brain surgeons in Edinburgh operating on patients in New Zealand. Those were Clark's exact words. He was right about this as well. Remote surgery became very real in 2001. A doctor who was in New York operated on a patient in France. How, you may ask? Robotics is the short answer. Did you ever have one of those remote control toys? The basic principle is the same. A surgeon controls a robotic arm performing the surgery. For this, they don't have to be present in the operating room. They can even be on another continent. Clark was spot on with this prediction. Don't commute, communicate. That sounds like an advertising slogan, right? Close enough. This is another example of how Clark saw it all. Recently, workers across the globe got used to remote work. Now they're simply refusing to return to the office. The least they'll accept is hybrid work. That's where you work from your bed for four days and then drop by the office one day to say hello. This would have been impossible in the 60s. I mean, you could stay at home, but then you wouldn't get paid. And this is not the end of Clark's predictions that came true. He was a pioneer in predicting the future. In 1945, he wrote an essay called Wireless World. A great title if we take into account that the first Wi-Fi network 
appeared in 1997. But what was this essay about? Nothing much, just about launching communication satellites into orbit. But wait a second, that was more than a decade before the first artificial satellite started orbiting the Earth. Wow, impressive. Okay, but it's not like Arthur C. Clarke predicted the invention of the internet or something. Well, he did. In 1974, he described a device called Comsol that every home would have. No, he wasn't talking about a gaming console. This Comsol would have a TV screen and a typewriter keyboard, and people would get information from it. Isn't this a desktop computer? Of course it is, but explained in the 70s terms. Clark could have also added the mouse as well. I mean, he got everything else right. He also predicted what this console slash PC would be used for. Getting bank statements, booking theater tickets, and browsing the news. This is exactly what we use computers and smartphones for today. And how do we do it? Google search. Arthur Clark had a vision of what a search engine would look like. Is there anything this man couldn't predict? Well... He believed cities would completely disappear, but they are only getting bigger. The World Bank estimates that nearly 56% of the world's population lives in cities today. This figure will only increase in the future. Sorry, Mr. Clark, that was a complete miss. Then there are borderline cases. The man spoke about a replicator. Sounds like a gadget from a Bugs Bunny cartoon. That's because it is. A machine that creates instant copies of everything is a bit off the charts. But, to be honest, we have 3D printers today, although they're not as sophisticated as Clark's replicator. But, who knows? This prophecy may come true in a decade or two. The British writer wasn't the only daydreamer of the period. Walter Cronkite, America's favored TV anchor, also had a go at predicting the future. Just three years after Clark's show aired on the BBC, Cronkite hosted a show called The 21st Century. The goal? to show viewers what a 21st century home would look like. And he was strangely good at it. Let's start with his vision of the living room. Full-color, big 3D television screen? Check. Console controls that operate various gadgets? Check. Music that plays from speakers at a push of a button? Check. Now, I could be wrong, but did Cronkite just describe a home entertainment system? I think so. Hungry for more? Step into the imaginary kitchen from the year 2001. The plates are made from plastic on the spot. Okay, that one was a bit off. But you can still buy disposable plates at the supermarket. That was not the case in the 60s. Also, you had to clean the house yourself back then, or hire help. Well, Cronkite and his guests hoped this would change. They spoke of small-scale robots that would accept instructions. They could even be programmed not to bump into humans while cleaning the home. And finally, these tiny robots wouldn't have to look anything like us. You're probably staring at the robot vacuum cleaner in the corner right now. Now let's talk business. The show imagined the home office with a futuristic printer. It would receive data from satellites and print our newspaper. Sounds naive enough today, but keep in mind that the first laser printer appeared half a decade after the show aired. There was also talk of a closed-circuit camera system. These intercom systems are in every home today. 60 years ago, you had to use a peephole to see who was at the door. But the most mysterious gadget Cronkite mentions is an electronic correspondence machine. They didn't explain its functions on the show, but it's possible they were referring to a smartphone. At the time, the TV remote controller was all but perfect, so this gadget seemed even more impressive. Okay, okay, we all know what you've been waiting for. Flying cars, right? Yes, Cronkite included this prediction in his other show, this time about the 20th century. Every now and then, there's news of a tech startup constructing a flying car. But it turns out to be a bust every single time. We can still only dream about taking off and flying over traffic jam. The show from the 60s got some things about cars right, though. Inflated pillows? They were probably referring to airbags, but misspoke. Cronkite also predicted anti-lock brakes. Manufacturers started installing these into cars decades later. Then there was cruise control and motion sensors. Tracking the distance to the car in front of you seems common today. In the 1960s, however, drivers could only dream about such a function. 
How many times have you heard your grandparents say how everything was a better quality back in their time? Well, this isn't always a good thing. Traffic signs were solid, so a car would be severely damaged if it hit them. Cronkite accurately predicted that modern road signs would be intentionally weakened to fail and save the driver's life. 